before we dive into this episode, I'm not saying I have favorite episodes, but this one is definitely going to hold a special place in my heart. Um, This episode with Dave kind of reminded me of not only that the people that we meet along the way in life, in this job, whatever, it's not coincidence. Um, I think that everybody is placed in our lives for a specific reason, and this just kind of this one hit a little close to home for me. Um, Dave is just, he's a really awesome friend that I have. And more so than that, it's so crucial to keep your support system, whether it's in this job and the people you meet or outside of this job and your family, your friends, whoever. Keeping your support system close, checking on your friends, it's so important. And Dave kind of reminds me of that in this episode. I just really appreciate the relationship that I have with Dave, but also I just appreciate the amount of support that I have, not just from Dave, but everybody, either if you listen to this podcast, if you're one of my friends, I just really appreciate a lot of the people in my life and mental health day or whatever, whatever it was that happened recently, but more than just, we need to take a day to check on our people. We need that constant reminder that everyone in our life deserves someone. And if you are that someone for somebody else, kudos to you. And if you can be that support system for somebody else, act on that, check on your people, and just remember that everybody deserves love. One other little thing is that there is a little bit of static. Um, I think I'm figuring out the problem. I know I keep saying that. I'm working on it, guys. Bear with me. I do apologize. I fixed as much as I possibly could. I also want to add in that I have quite a significant amount of bloopers in this one just because it was it was a good conversation. It, it was a good episode to record, but Dave is hilarious, and I can't disrupt the flow of how everything went, but I can't, I would be amiss to not at least include it at the end. So let's get started. The views and opinions expressed on this platform are of me, myself, and I, not any agency I'm affiliated with. So please do not take what I say personally. Today on the podcast, I have with me Mr. Dave Allen. Dave and I met, It's a, it was a minute ago, um, during, dude, what was it? It was something in Houston. Was it like the ice storm? It was a Texas cold snap. Yeah, we uh we ended up in Texas, and Dave, you're not even from Texas. I'm not from Texas, but you're a little bit farther away. Yep, yeah, I'm in Arizona. Yeah, so we uh you work at a different agency. I work at a different agency. Um, we all kind of met up at this quote unquote deployment where we ended up like day one. We get to the central location, and they tell us like, "Hey guys, uh, thanks for showing up," but like. We needed y'all days ago, and now we don't really know what to do, so (laughs) So, that was exciting. But we ended up, we were holed up at a hotel. They kind of were trying to figure out what they're going to do with this, and very long story short, we all got acquainted. Um, Dave and his team, they were really awesome people. Uh, We all just kind of hung out, and in a turn of events, a very twisted turn of events, um... Not saying what agency, but they tried to kill me. They brought some bagels that had some... No, I'm just kidding. I'm totally kidding. But there were some bagels, and we were munching on them, and they ended up having some... I don't know if they got cross-contaminated, whatever. But I had a reaction, and it was my first big, intense one. It was a pretty intense one. And Dave was there, helped save my life. I owe everything to this guy. (laughs) It was a team effort. It, it was, but there was one point I just, like, I came back, too, after all the meds took effect again. And I wake up, and I, like, look up, and it's Dave, and he's, like, bagging me with the BVM. And I'm like, oh, this is how this day is going. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> we all go way back. <laughs> and all I remember is you showing me that I'm number one. <laughs> I'll just put it this way. There are people in your life that you know you can, like, joke with, 
<laughs> there's certain people you can joke with, and Dave is one of the ones that gets my sense of humor, and I appreciate that. <laughs> so, Dave, you want to tell the people, give a little introduction about yourself. Well, my name is Dave, as I already stated. i um, been doing this now for close to 14 years. Just uh, got my recertification done, so I got year 15 and 16 in the bag. Um, I've worked for a private um, ambulance company, and uh, I'm not afraid to say it. I work for AMR right now. Um, they are, it's a really awesome organization. I know that some people have their issues with it, but I don't. AMR has always uh, clothed me. They've uh, kept my lights on, and they've offered me some amazing, amazing opportunities all over the U.S. that have just really changed my life. In fact, one of those, like you said, led me to meet you. Um, other things, I'm a dad. I've got two kids. Um, I'm divorced. Uh, I am engaged right now. I've got an awesome fiance who supports me in this industry. And that's really it. There's nothing else more about me. So mad respect on being able to say the agency you work at. I know like for me at least, I kind of, I'm iffy on like, man, I don't want to say like where I came from. I don't want to whatever, just because like, you know, sometimes there's conflict, whatever, but like Mad respect for that. Also, you uh, you post up with your fiance, and it is the funniest relationship. Like the the things that the interactions y'all have, it makes my day. And it's so commendable to find somebody that, like you said, supports you in this industry because it's a hard job as is. But like from the perspective of the significant other who is there, like when you're not on the job when things are happening, whatever, and just even, like, with the shift work itself, hard to find, so kudos to your fiancé. Yeah, thank you. Another thing that Dave did not mention is that dude's hilarious. Tell me, uh, tell me about the skeletons, because you did show me there's one at the table, there's two outside the window, and it's not just a Halloween thing. This is not just a Halloween thing. Um, I have carried skeletons on my truck, possibly on the job. <laughs> And in my car for, oh man, I want to say maybe a year or so before COVID ended. Uh, so here's Skelly. At the kitchen table. At the, <laughs> at the kitchen table. table. <laughs> and then, yep. Yeah, uh, Outside the window. <laughs> Outside the window. Um, I've had skeletons now. I have, uh, I think, about 30 at the moment. They're all over the place. I have them climbing up the palm trees outside and in the car, on my boat, everywhere you can think of. But I was at a really um, bad time in life. I had just got a divorce, and I was just spiraling down a deep, deep, uh, just a bit of despair. And the next thing I know, I was walking through... Um, it was September, I think it was, and I'm walking to Fry's and I see the skeleton. If something told me to just buy it, we're going to start making memes with this stuff. And so I bought it and immediately, even inside of the box, I snapped a photo of it and made a meme out of it. And it just, it's gone from there. And yeah, it seems crazy, but it's even helped my kids. I have pictures of my daughter grabbed him and started dancing with them and my son's doing stuff with them. And it's just <laughs> It's just taken off, and although I might not see all the photos, I've had people from all over, um, every state you could think of, driving by, taking photos, doing videos, and it just makes people smile. And just seeing people smile has helped pull me out of that deep, dark pit of despair, and it's just stayed on ever since. I think right now it's going on, I want to say, five years with these skeletons all over the place. It's iconic, and like that was one of the funniest things. Whenever we first met, I was like, "Dude, this guy, like, that is hilarious." I didn't know the backstory behind it, which is that's a whole other reason to keep it going. But it's hilarious. I had sent you forever ago. I don't know if you remember. Saw a skeleton in a moving van, and I was like, "Oh, look, it's Dave." It makes sense. <laughs> I remember that. So, dude, I mad respect for it, especially now. But it's it's hilarious. Um. Doesn't doesn't Skelly have an Instagram? What's the handle? Dave N. Skelly. So it's just Dave, the letter N, Skelly. That's it. 20 out of 10 recommend going and checking that out. <laughs> um, kind of want to circle back. You said you've been in EMS for quite a minute. Quite a yes. minute. It's, mm -hmm. it's longer than 
most people's lifetime in EMS as a total, but I mean, honestly, probably longer than mine is going to be, just being quite frank. Um, super commendable, because it's just, there's so many aspects of this job that's hard as is, and I don't know, sometimes the payout's not really worth it, but, like, you've stayed in it for so long, um, and you're you're an EMT, correct? Mm-hmm. So you said before about why you haven't gone to the jump to paramedic, and I think it's commendable. Like, if you don't want to, don't do it. I feel like there's a pressure in EMS. People feel like they have to go from EMT to advanced EMT or to paramedic, whatever, and make the leap. Like, why haven't you made the leap? When I first did my ride-alongs, Back in EMS school, I met a fire captain, and he sat me down, and we were talking, and I was a young, spry individual. Um, This was back in 2009, so I was 29, and, no, I'm sorry, 28, I was 2008. Um, Anyways, the the fire captain sat me down, he said, listen, I'm going to give you a piece of advice, and I really wish that I took it all the way to heart, but I didn't. He said, don't do anything in this industry that's going to take more time away from your family than it already will. And I'm divorced. I only get my kids part-time. And half the time that I'm scheduled to have them, I don't get them because I'm working the truck. Um, and so if I were to go to paramedic school, that would take more time out from school. I would lose what time that I have with my kids and with my fiance, with my family. And I don't want that. So I stuck it out as an EMT. And honestly, because of that, I've been blessed. I've never had an instance where a phone bill wasn't paid or the electricity was cut off or the water wasn't cut off. I've always been able to pay my uh, mortgage. Um, I've just been really, really smart with it and being where I am. And now here I am. 14 years in, like I say, going for 15, 16. I'm almost, almost to a place where I can retire, and I'm still comfortable. It is such a crucial piece of advice. I know, like, most of the times we don't take that, but it's good stuff, man. Um, In the long-ish length of your time in EMS, because, again, it's not just a matter of, like, you're in a career for 15, 16 years. I feel like every year in EMS is equated to, like, three years in any other job, honestly. <laughs> Oh, yeah. So how, like, what has kept you even going? Because you could easily switch to another job. Like, what, what is preventing burnout for you? If you are burnout, that's fine. Um, the list is absolutely vast on that. Number one, you've already seen it. I've got my skeleton stuff. Um, that keeps me, uh, I, I'd like to say sane. Everybody else says that I'm insane for it. <laughs> but there is my faith. There's that. I have a amazing support system that I've built up. Like I said, my fiance is there. I have friends inside the industry that I talk with. Um, I have decided to change my lifestyle instead of doing things that would push me down a deep path like alcoholism, uh, substance abuse. Um, I've turned my life around. Um, I'm hiking and the people that I hike with, they are also in the industry. A buddy of mine, his name is Scott Odell, an amazing guy, also works for the company. He and I, we've been hiking for the past year and a half, and it's just great to have those people that we can relate to in it. Um, I mean, that's basically it. Um, I love the fact that no two calls are going to be the same. I could never be in an industry, and I thought about it. Working inside of a hospital, I can't do it because I'm enclosed. Being out in the field, I'm looking up at the sky. I'm looking out at everything around me. And there's so much to do. On top of that, again, I can sit there and uh, badmouth everything, but AMR is such an amazing corporation. They gave us FEMA deployments. They have sent me all over the U.S. on some of the most amazing deployments that I've ever been on. I'm meeting so many people, getting to do EMS in other areas, learning different systems. And I get to meet amazing people, again, our relationship would not have happened if we had not signed up for the FEMA uh, deployments. So that's all preventing me from getting burned out. I mean, I am so amped up, so amped up for the next few years to come because I don't know what's going to happen. And to me, that's exciting. I just really love your passion because it's contagious. Cause now, like, like I said a minute ago, like I'm feeling a little burnout, whatever. But now I'm like, man, this is a cool job. I do love this job. I should get back to work. 
<laughs> it's the most amazing thing ever. We are sitting there in someone's darkest hours, and we're trying everything we can to make sure that they stay alive. What's not awesome about that? Yeah. And um, highlighting something else you said, it's it's the matter of, like, one, kudos, turning your life around. Like, that's those are hard decisions. Being able to say, not just a matter of, like, oh, I have these goals, you know, I want to start doing this, whatever, but actually doing them, that's hard. It's very hard. So kudos to you for that. Um, you had posted the, the video of the hike where y'all had, like, the bagpipes and, like, the music with it. Dude, that was, in, I literally, I think I commented, like, man, I'm crying. I literally sat and sobbed. Like, the view was gorgeous. That moment was so surreal. I felt like I was there with you. Like, <laughs> so thank you for that experience. I'm glad you changed your life so that way I could experience that, too. So, uh, <laughs> but, um, kind of, yeah, so what you said about, like, just the changes, but also who you surround yourself with. Because, in I feel like what some people imagine in EMS, like there are some rough characters out there. We'll, we'll just say that. There are some rough characters. But there are also people that, like you're talking about, can uplift you and can meet you at that level and support you. We, we can build each other up. So, like, you're one of those people for me where I'm like, man, like, I need to do better. Like, I need some positivity. I'm like, I wonder what Dave's doing. Dave is always positive. <laughs> so, thank you for that. <laughs> Like you said, no two calls are the same. And it's even in the same, like, we have the same treatments for many types of calls because we have our protocols, we have our orders. We know what to do in these situations, but not every call is the same. Not every diabetic, you know, whatever emergency, those diabolical diabetics. Those two are not the same. Not every overdose is the same. Not every psych call is the same. Absolutely not the same. So... What what would you say is your favorite type? Because you have you have your medicals, you have your traumas, you have your cardiacs, you have your overdoses, you have your diabetics, you have your even like you can even say cardiac arrest. You have your psych. There's so lithosis. There's so many options of whatever is gonna come out. So what would you say is your favorite type of call and why? I love a good trauma. Because in the trauma, there are so many different systems that can be involved with. There's so many different factors that you have to be at work for. And you get to do the most hands-on. And you, most of the time, get a more favorable, uh, favorable outcome. I mean, yeah, CPR, you're hands-on too. But out of that one, I only have a handful of code saves. Only a handful. But that's because you're fighting the reaper. And some of these people, I mean, you know what? It's just their time to go. You just you can't save them. But a trauma... Oh, it's great. I mean, I'm, I'm sorry. I, I just have to say it. Because somebody with the tip tip fracture, hey, you know what? Let's go to make a boot out of the sky. You know, let's go to split this up. How can I do it? Yeah, it's so great. You know, figuring things out. It's good. Very true. So I guess we can label you as a trauma junkie. I am a trauma junkie. I love it. <laughs> no, I'm kind of with you. Like, I would put myself in more of the medical cardiac calls. I love a good respiratory, whatever. But, like, sometimes they're just, and not that you would ever wish this on somebody, but sometimes you just need a good trauma call because it's not so much cut and dry, but, like, you can see the thing, you know what's wrong. Or, like, you're talking about, there's that complex issue of, like, okay, if, if it's a car wreck, did a medical issue cause the person to be involved in the car wreck? Is the car wreck the thing that happened and now it's a medical issue? It's also, it's not so much, like everyone says, it's, it's cut and dry, like I even just said. So it's a whole system of things. And then you got all the systems that are in work trying to have the body, like, keep surviving. Mm -hmm. So I totally agree with that. However, comma, I don't do teeth. Anytime it's a fall or something happens and there are teeth involved, <laughs> like, I'm not squeamish. I, things don't make my stomach turn, but one time this, this lady fell and the family, like we're, we're assessing her and all that stuff. And the family comes around and they have a plastic baggie, put it in my face and they say, Oh, here's the teeth. I literally gagged. I almost threw up. It was a rough time for everybody involved. I can't do teeth. <laughs> I can't do teeth, man. I, I'm great with all of that. What I can't do is medical procedures. Like I was doing an interfacility transport and somebody was getting a 
Now they were being checked. They were having a biopsy done to see if there was cancer. And the doctor told me, said, Dave, here, take these uh, trade medical tools. I'm like, okay. And I'm sitting there. And then they numb the lady's arm up. They cut into it. And they start monkeying around with tweezers and everything. And I just remember just and just getting a sickness in my stomach. I just could feel myself go white as a ghost. And the doctor looks up and she's like, Dave, you okay? I'm like, I love it. He's like, why don't you sit down? And I'm like, okay. And I set the tray down. I just like, oh my gosh, it was the worst thing ever. But no, show me, you know, show me an internal decapitation. Hey, cool. I'm good with that. You know, open fractures, compounds. Yeah, let's do this thing. Hey, look, a prolapsed organ. That's neat. Medical procedures, not for me. <laughs> Bones sticking out, fine, perfect day vibes, but God, the stitches, not the stitches. Not the stitches. <laughs> what you doing there? Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I think it's also kind of a good thing that, like, finding EMS versus just getting, like, a hospital job. Kind of also, like you said, it's the being outside, being out in that environment, but also the smell of a hospital is enough to where I'm like, Ugh. but so, um, anyways, um, so you've, in your time in EMS, you've gone through a lot of calls and especially some of the areas that you've worked in, I'm sure you've seen some stuff. What is the funniest or the craziest call you've ever had? And I'm ready. Dude, I'm so ready. <laughs> They're not as crazy as you think. No. Really? They're, I mean, if you do, you want funny or do you want crazy? Like, do you want like the bloodiest stuff or do you want the funniest stuff? Do both. Do whatever. <laughs> Go ahead. Story right. time. Let's do it. Story so, time with Dave. It's my favorite day. There's, there's there's two calls that actually stand out for the funniest. One of them was a it was a psychiatric call. Is what I'm going to chalk it up to. But the lady called 911 and had us respond because she was no longer able to talk to her priest of her church. Because she had called so many times that he just stopped answering the phone. So she thought that if we called from our phones that it would show up on his as 911 and he would answer the phone so that she could start talking to her pastor again. To her priest. And we're just like... (laughs) We get there, she's like, I've tried everyone, I've tried my abbot, my pat, my priest, I've talked to the choir people, no one's taking my phone call anymore, and I'm like, there's a reason why. I was about to this say, what kind of person are you that your priest doesn't want to talk to you anymore? <laughs> like, what do you exactly. have to do? Exactly, exactly, exactly. And then there was another one, it was environmental um, illness, and, um... This is a while ago. Uh, a guy, he was just going nuts. And he thought he was possessed by the devil. Oh. And so he's, my partner at the time, his name was Jesus. And we were working with another guy by the name of Nano. And this is one of my favorite calls, but I, um, so we're, we're patching the guy up. He's like, oh, oh, I'm possessed. I am possessed. You need to help me. And Nano's in the back going, what What do I, what, what do we do? He's like, I need Jesus to bless holy water. I need to sprinkle on me. And my partner, he's just like, well, my name is Jesus. And the guy's like, oh, that's close enough. So my partner, he starts blessing this bottle of water that Nano had found in the back of the ride. And then Nano started sprinkling on him, saying, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And the guy's like, oh, 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 this is great. This is great. Yeah, this is amazing. Oh, and I mean, the whole thing was just going on and on like that. I'm just up front trying my hardest to just keep steering the truck and going straight to the hospital because I'm laughing my butt off. <laughs> I couldn't believe this is going on at the back of the ride. I really couldn't. So there, there were those two. Um, that was that. Um, one of the craziest uh, calls that I had was I mentioned a spinal decapitation. A guy was going about 95 on a... Uh, on a um, highway and another car was coming up they turned a corner and he slammed right into him the force of the impact decapitated him internally severed his spine and i get on there and i get inside and i just hold c-spine you know boom that's what i was going to do and i was going to stay there until my partner could come over after he had finished assessing the other one so we got some uh, other uh, units on scene and as i'm sitting there holding this guy's spine He's talking like you and I right now. And then all of a sudden, something, he, he shifted his body. 
And as soon as he shifted, immediately he started becoming phasic. His oh. words started slurring, everything else was going. So we finally, my partner got over, got to Colorado. We had a bird landed, we loaded him up, and they launched him to a trauma center. We had a follow-up, and it said that he had a spinal decapitation. And when he shifted his body, it had immediately started to pinch his uh, spine, and he didn't make it after that. He was he was toast. Oh, so my So that was one God. of the craziest ones. Another one was a guy that, he was an elderly gentleman. God bless his soul. It was 2 a.m. He was hauling a trailer with his truck. He decided he needed to go to the bathroom, so he pulled off to the side of the road. He didn't put his car in park. Oh. He got out of his truck, went in front of it, and his truck rolled right over him. There was a hook underneath the truck that picked onto, uh, that uh, attached onto his overalls. The tire ran over his head. So here's where your teeth thing. His teeth were like embedded in the concrete right there, the asphalt. And then the truck sat there and drug him probably about 25 yards. Oh we got there. Yeah, his nose was involved. It was hanging off. His ear was involved, hanging off too. So that was a fun one to go ahead and wrap up and take into the ER. But he wasn't dead. He wasn't dead. He was sitting there. He was talking to me, just like you and I are talking to each other. I kid you not. Teeth out and then in the, in the asphalt, ear and everything hanging off. I always want to be able to do my job, but I can't promise in that moment. That wouldn't have been a thing. I, like, I'm getting not. Oh, God. Poor guy. How's your sandwich? Yeah, it's great. I, I am going to not finish any of the rest of this. Thank you. <laughs> if you wouldn't have said it embedded in the concrete, we'd be fine right now. But it's, uh... <laughs> what are the odds? One, he wouldn't put it in a park. And then, two, it would, like, hook on his overall. Poor guy. <laughs> oh, my gosh. She won... The worst lottery on earth. <laughs> That's all I can say. And I'm sure you've learned a lot because you're also an FTO, right? Yes. I'm sure you learned a lot throughout the years and you instilled a lot of wisdom. You've taught a lot of people. What is a piece of advice you give to someone either going into EMS, someone already in EMS, someone thinking of making the switch? Like what what is something you give as a piece of advice or something you tell people like, what you got? Tell me what you got. All right, so the first one you and I already talked about is never do anything that's going to take more time away from your spouse and your kids than it's already going to do. Another one is is that you're never going to make a lot of money in EMS. You never will. So you need to go in and structure your life and your lifestyle around the paycheck that you get. It's when you start believing that you are worth more or that you are entitled to have more, that's when things get dicey when it comes down to your lifestyle. So there's that one. Um, another piece of advice is something that I've learned inside this job is that none of us, none of us are promised a tomorrow. And because we're not promised a tomorrow, never go to bed angry. Always resolve whatever it is that's going on with your loved one before you go to bed. Because you don't know if you or them are going to wake up. Also, never ever leave your house with saying I love you. Never leave your house without giving your loved ones a hug. I've learned so, I've learned in this industry by running on people and also because my friends have also died that you never ever know if you're going to see somebody again. You don't. We had a young man that was gunned down in Tucson. You know what? Who knows what his life was like before that? Who knows what he said before he went out? Who knows if he was able to give that opportunity to his loved ones to say, I love you and stuff like that before it happened. Don't don't ever do that to your loved one. Don't don't do that to yourself. Um, and honestly, the last thing that is, don't piss dispatch off. True. Preach. Go ahead. <laughs> you know, that's that's basically it. That's it. You know, if you love this job. You're never going to work another day in your life. If this job is a stepping stone or you are totally sold on this job, you know what? You're going to hate it. I like that you said that's all. Like, you're not just dropping wisdom and, like, saying things that I need to hear right now. And it kind of hurts, but... (laughs) 
man. If nothing else, this episode is for me. Like, sorry, everybody else. Like, everyone can glean something from this. Like, this has been a good one, but man, this is uh, this has been for me. This is my episode. Whoa. Um. No, one of the things you said about um, we're not promised tomorrow. That's it's been the wildest thing to realize. Like, you go into EMS knowing like you're gonna see things and you're gonna you know see death, all this stuff. But so like since entering into EMS, one of the things I've realized is that. The, not only is the human body so fragile, but, like, the way people's luck just sometimes just runs out or the way that, like, we can't we can't save everybody, which is part of it, but just, right. like, the way fate just kind of determines or, you know, higher powers that be, the big man upstairs, like, we can't change that. But, man, it, like, just life itself is so fragile. That's one thing I learned from EMS, like you talked about. Life is so fragile, man. It really is. It is. Um, and another thing that's fragile that people don't really like to talk about is our psyche. I mean, our mental state is extremely fragile. And there are some people who are strong and some people who lack a strength, so to say, that get into this industry. And cumulatively, what we see can break a person. Oh, absolutely. 100%. I've, I've seen it time and time again. Um, and unless you develop those support systems, unless you put checks and balances in place, um, this job can take you. Kind of like you're saying, and one of the things I've been preaching recently is even if it's not like that call, like you're saying, it's the accumulation. It's not like you're going to join EMS and then you get that one call and like, I mean, they will affect you, but sometimes it's not even just that one call. It's the ones yeah. that happen over and over, and just it all builds up. And if you don't have a support system, if you don't have, like, healthy habits, if you don't have the things that you have to have in general, but also in this job, if you don't have that, dude, it will break you. That's, and if it doesn't break you, it's going to make you burn out. And you're, no one's yeah. going to want to work with you. You're just going to be a miserable person. And that's that's what yep. happened to me recently. I just, I'm on a little hiatus right now, kind of because of things like that. But that's one of the things I told my partner. I was like, hey, I'm going to be out for, you know, a couple of shifts, whatever. And she was like, okay. I was like, I just, I feel like I'm just getting burnt out too. I don't, I don't, you know, I don't have the, I've got to recenter myself basically. Like I've got to focus on myself for a second. I'm getting burnt out. And she was like, I didn't want to tell you, but you kind of have been pretty toxic to work with. And that hurt, but having someone be able to be honest with me about that, not everyone has that. So I was very thankful for that. But, yeah, it's this job is not for everybody. And if, and if it's not for you, like, it's not cowardly for you to find something else and admit that. I think it makes you a stronger person instead of trying to push through it, push yourself too far, and just... I mean, make everyone else miserable to work that has to work with you because yeah. you don't know when to stop. Right. And I agree with that. Um, I do. Um, but one thing that AMR has been really awesome with is that we have a CISN program in some areas. And that's, um, it is a way to debrief after a critical incident, a stressful call, or even inside of something that's going on in your outside life. And we can sit there and sit down with you and debrief you and try to help you realize coping mechanisms and ways to keep going. And, um, we're not therapists. That's not what it's supposed to be. But it's more or less, hey, you know what? You're not doing it alone because we've been there and we understand it's, uh, some of what you're going through. Sorry, I was getting a call. Um, <laughs> um, no, good. no, exactly. And the system, I feel like some people don't respect it just because I feel like people do go into it thinking like oh well this is gonna be like a therapy session to solve everything no it's like you're saying it's to talk about what happened get through it help you for the long run whatever but it's not to solve the problems um and you're right we're not there to solve the problem we're just there to walk you through it but we also will sit there and point you to our EAP pro, uh, program and other programs too where the therapist will be able to help you out. Oh yeah, uh, dude. The agency, those areas. The agency I was at—that's one of the things they had an EAP, and there was one day like my supervisor 
after a couple of calls or whatnot, he called me. He's like, hey, you're not going to like this, but I'm recommending and I'm partially telling you, you have to call our EAP program. You have to talk to therapists because of this, this call and this matter, it's affecting you. And I am forever thankful that I did that because it, long run, I, I couldn't have gone through some of the other calls that popped up because, like, because of how that affected me. So 20 out of 10, do recommend. And another thing, though, that I think is commendable about how, because EMS is fairly new in the health industry in general, but one of the things that's evolving over time is the the mentality of how people view mental health and first responders, not even in EMS. I'll go ahead and branch out to first responders in general, that it's not so much that you join and you have you have the people that are like, well, if you can't handle this job, just quit, or this is how it is, suck it up, we don't cry over call. Like, not that you should cry over every call, like, that's a lot. But, I mean, if you do, that's, that's your coping mechanism. Do you, boo. But, like... <laughs> It's changed to where now, like, we look out for each other. And if we see somebody's not doing good or somebody's not coping well, we reach out to each other. And it's not stigmatized, I guess, of, oh, well, you're going to therapy? Hmm. Well, guess you can't handle this job. Or, oh, you need outside resources to help you? Hmm. Guess you can't handle this job. And I think that's one of the, if nothing else, if not, if, if not that, even I think it's better than advancing medications or finding better ways to do things because if we're not here 100 percent or if we're not at our 100 percent we can't be that for patients so it doesn't matter how advanced you are how many meds you have how great your intubation success rate is or your ROS grades whatever if you don't if you're not if you don't have an agency that takes care of your people you're going to fail ultimately and I agree with that 100 percent and again that's that's one of the things I can't I can't thank my the company AMR enough for what they have put in place to try to help their employees. Unfortunately, like you said, there is a stigma, and so many people get in there and think that even though we have these programs, even though there are those of us that are willing to help each other, they won't take that hand because they do view it as weakness, and it's not a weakness, it's a strength. Um, I just currently lost a good co-worker um, to a mental illness uh, within the past uh, couple weeks. And it's, this is really, a, it's, it's kind of a hard time of year. Um, my partner of seven and a half years, I lost him on the ride uh, not too long ago. Um, I want to say uh, it was about four or five years ago. Um, and then another buddy of mine, he also lost his battle around this time too and it's if they would have just reached out if they wouldn't if they would have just there's so many things to that i want to say but i miss them and most of those people were the support structure that i had so thankfully uh yeah um that sucks. Yeah, dude, really I, was, sucks. I was about to say, I had no clue. I am, dude, I'm so sorry. I am so sorry. It's, but it, it is the way, it's the industry, it's the mentality of the people inside of the industry. Because we're so macho, we're so tough. But we don't have to be, and that's, that's what, it's so hard. It's hard to break that stigma, even though we're doing better. Like you said, it's hard to break that stigma of, I'm an EMS, I'm a first responder, whatever we are, and I have to be tough because if not, people are going to judge me or something like that. And that's. But it is absolutely okay to ask for help. Like you said, it makes you a it, stronger person. It does. It honestly does. And then that makes you a stronger person to help when somebody else needs a shoulder to cry on. Us. They need some sort of a, a light because they're going through a hard time. Kind of. Like you're saying about the support system, especially when you reach out or when you say you need help, whatever it is, um, I've even heard about it in those like SISM meetings. Nobody says anything, but someone finally says something, and it's either the question everybody else had or it's the thing that everybody else was thinking, but nobody wants to be the first one to say it. 
um, in your support system, how somebody explained to me one time, it's like there's a nail on a board. And on that nail is like a string or like a rope. And there's down as you go, there's like, we'll call them wine glasses, kind of like wine glasses that are tied. And to each wine glass after is another rope with another wine glass. And it's another one with another wine glass. Kind of like our connections in life with people and stuff like that. You never know what happens when you cut one of those. All of the other ones are going to cascade with it and fall. And especially with um, losing those people. And especially, dude, you've lost a lot. That's, that's tough. That is tough. Um, when you lose those people, it just it's not just that person that when when they lose that battle it's not just them that's affected it's it's so many people in their life and people that you never even know that gets affected by that and it's it's not worth it not to get the help you need or to and it's it's hard it is hard to reach out it's hard to get that help it's hard to open up and say that you're dealing with that kind of stuff but man it's you, you got to have your people that you reach out to you got to have that and not just having it, but we have to do better on being that person for somebody else. No, 100%. You have to. And it, when you become that person for somebody else and you're able to help them, there is a little bit of a, a light that shines bright inside of you. It actually helps your own mental health. The saddest thing when somebody takes their life, especially in this industry, is that you never understand the ripple effect that that actually has down the line. We're in this industry because we were built and we want to help people. But when you struggle and you take yourself out of the equation, you prevent yourself from helping the people down the line that you were supposed to help. If that makes sense. Yeah. You never know. Kind of like you're saying, like with each other, but I would even branch it into you never know. Patients. I was about to say, you never know with that next patient. There could be that next patient that needs exactly what you have. Because even though we're all trained the same way, everyone has something different to add and give value to the, the people we interact. Because at the core of it, no matter how much fun you have with your partners, no matter how cool meds are, no matter how cool all this stuff, at the core of it, we are here for the human interaction we have. Yeah. You, you never know when it's going to be that patient that needed exactly what you have. And, dude, I'm 100% on board with what you're saying. Yeah. So I guess this is a no-brainer question, but if you could change it all, would you still take the path and go into EMS? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'd still be here. I would still be here. Uh, it's kind of the last one I got, but what is a recent or past call that has challenged you? Oh, man. You know, I hate to say this, but I am at a spot where there really isn't any challenges um, except for just being mentally there for the patient. Now, prior to the spot that I'm at now, um, I was in a very, very high volume um, area. Um, we can, Like I said, we got traumas all over the place, left and right, just everything in there you can think of but now the area that i'm in is more like uh we get a lot of psychiatric calls and the part that is most challenging in that area is rolling up on scene and going oh no not this person again okay why are you calling again you just called 911 is to put that aspect aside and say okay yes i understand you've said this guy is falling several times before you've cried wolf but maybe this is the one that actually is the real deal and have to keep that mentality in place. Put them again before yourself. That's the most challenging aspect of this job right now for me. No, you're exactly right. Especially you got your people that call, like you're saying, for the same stuff all the time. But even more so, I would say, with site calls, just because we don't have a lot of training on it. Cause, and that's not a default to any EMS program. It's a matter of, it, it's hard because they're, one, the, the call itself rapidly evolves. Two, it's just a hard call in general because you never know, like, 
how often this, how long this has been a problem or right. what, what to do. And it's just, it's not our specialty, but we still, you can't just not do anything. Like you're saying, Agreed. you have to at least, you have to give some effort. You have to try to be there for that patient. So you got anything else you want to, you want to talk about? You want to add? You want to, floor is all you. It's, I mean, it's been all you. Shoot, I just. I exist at this point, but, uh, <laughs> no, I'm just, it's been a wild ride. It's been awesome. And, um, I'm thankful for the family members that I've made in this, uh, in this industry. I mean, it's kind of funny. We're talking about this, but Wayne's not here. Uh, he was a big part of what happened down there in uh, Texas. Um, but there's just so many things and just, like I said, I'm so excited to see what the next six years, I don't know, 20 years is going to be. You know, I, I tell people I'm going to die thumping on somebody's chest. You know, that's going to be it. <laughs> oh, what happened today? If cardiac arrest doing, if working on somebody, you know, I don't know. I'm just, I'm excited. I mean, this is just, this has been, it, this wasn't the, the dream that I thought I was going to be living. Um, but it is the dream job that I have found. And I'm just totally in love with it. Your passion, it's, con- it's contagious. More than you know, it is contagious, man. I feel like I'm being infected by, I feel like I'm re-injected by how green I was back in the gap. So I, I needed this, man. I needed this. All it takes is just a little bit of fertilizer to just get you going. Mm, delicious. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, dude, you don't have anything else? I. I don't. I'm it's been so awesome to reconnect with you. Oh, dude, same. Especially after this, I'm speechless. I, <laughs> which doesn't happen often. So. <laughs> <laughs> Not gonna say anything. <laughs> dude, it's been awesome. So with that. So guys, if you have any questions, comments, concerns, future topic ideas, please email me at twenty two at the lips podcast at gmail.com. Again, that's two, two, at the lips podcast at gmail.com. Thanks. Never stop learning and be safe out there, friends. All right, let's do it. Let's go. Let's get it. Get this bread, literally with the sandwich. Pulled it through the belly button, dude. I almost <laughs> lost it. I couldn't. I, I literally turned around and went, Oh god, this is it. <laughs> See, I told you if I saw that, I'd be done. I just I would have passed out. Just <laughs> so the girl's with... Dave, she's on the ground. <laughs> <laughs> the girl I was with she like grabbed my arm, she's like, Hey, hey, don't lock your knees. You good? I'm like, No, I'm not good. I've got to get out of here. <laughs> Already EMS. Someone already in having a stroke. Do you have strawberries? Do you have strawberries? I was wondering what was in the sandwich. No. <laughs> Better have your happy pen this time. <laughs> One partner asked me after, he was like, Alexis, are you, are you trying to, like, in yourself? I'm like, no, I'm just I'm really dumb. That's not it. <laughs> no, what? <laughs> what? <laughs>